political questions that have been listed for the Minister. And I call Mr Barry Michael Duff. Uh, can I ask the Minister to take this opportunity to outline the timeline and process for the proposed consultation on amending the law relating to fatal fetal abnormality? Well, I can only give the House a general outline. Uh, as I said last week in response to questions from the media, uh, the likelihood is that a, publication, uh, a document will be published for consultation before Easter time of next year. This is because of the, uh, the situation that arose um, when uh, the matter was being looked at it in terms of the guidance, which is the responsibility of DHS SPS. When the Minister of Health made clear last week uh, that it was not possible to deal with the issue of fatal fetal abnormality under any reform to DHS SPS guidelines, he made it clear that the matter then lay as criminal law with the Department of Justice. And in response to questions from the media, I gave that general indication, but matters are at an early stage of drawing up the consultation document. And members will also be aware, of course, that I reported last May that we were looking at the issue of a consultation on the issue of the premises on which uh, abortions could be performed. So this is now feeding into that also to look at the issue of fatal fetal abnormality. Call Mr Michael Duff for a supplementary. Can I ask the Minister to provide an assurance that the consultation will be as broad and as thorough as possible? and that such a consultation will fully involve this Assembly? I think, Deputy Speaker, that has been the case with every one of the very many consultations DOJ has done in the last three and a half years, and I can assure Mr McElduff I'm not changing my way of doing things now. Call Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. On the same issue, can I ask the Minister if he could clarify uh, for the Assembly the circumstances in which he issued a statement to the media last week in relation to the consultation on abortion law? Uh, the circumstances were, broadly as I outlined to Mr McElduff, at question time last Tuesday, the Minister of Health, Social Services and Public Safety confirmed that it was not possible to deal with the issue of fatal fetal abnormality under the revised guidelines. Uh, the DOJ had been holding off on its role on the consultation around abortion until we established uh, what the DHS SPS guidelines might manage in that respect. Once it was confirmed that that was not the case, I believe the Minister of Health was contacted by the media and asked for a statement of his position. I was certainly contacted by the media and asked for a statement of mine and made it clear that having given the undertaking that DOJ would deal with the issue if DHS SPS could not, it then became clear that the matter fell to us and I answered in the affirmative. It was not an announcement of the consultation details, it was an announcement of what the process will be. Call Mr Little for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister uh, for his clarification. Can I ask the Minister uh, how this will relate to the consultation in relation to abortion law that he committed to earlier this year? I believe, Deputy Speaker, that uh, we will have um, potentially a number of issues to consider around the matter of abortion. But what was clear was. Uh, at the point when the Assembly did not pass an amendment to the Criminal Justice Bill, which would have rendered uh, abortions which were otherwise lawful, unlawful if not performed on health service premises, uh, at that stage it fell to the DOJ to look at a consultation around that aspect of abortion law. Uh, what was clear then was we, we got wrapped up further into the issue of fatal fetal abnormality, and it was appropriate to await uh, the uh, DHS SPS resolution of that point. That having now been re resolved from the health point of view, there will be a single consultation looking at all the relevant aspects of abortion law in the spring of next year. Call Mr. Pat Ramsey for a <coughs> topic. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Justice Minister what discussions he's had with the Chief Constable? or any other agencies in Northern Ireland regarding the criminal investigation on the Bloody Sunday? I have not discussed the issue of the criminal investigation into Bloody Sunday specifically with the Chief Constable. Obviously, I discuss issues of uh, such matters generally with the Chief Constable, but as I understand it, the issue fell to the Chief Constable operationally to deal with the issue following the outcome of the Savile report. Well, Mr Ramsey, for some <coughs> I thank the Minister Albio. I wouldn't be content with his response. As Justice Minister, you do you not feel you have a responsibility and duty of care to ensure and give reassurance to those families whose loved ones were murdered on Bloody Sunday, to give them some hope for the future 
in the foreseeable future that accountability will take place and a criminal investigation will commence? Well, Deputy Speaker, I share Mr Ramsey's concern, but I cannot give an assurance to bereaved families as to how operational policing will be carried out in an area which is precisely the responsibility of the Chief Constable. I cannot uh, direct him what, invasion, what investigations to carry out or not to carry out, and we would be in a very bad way if I could. I appreciate the concerns which Mr Rousey has put forward, but they are concerns which are operational matters for the Chief Constable and not for the Minister. Mr Declan McAleer is not in his place. I call Mr Kieran McCarthy. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister, um, as I understand that he attended the European Justice and Home Affairs Council recently in Brussels. Um, could the Minister provide a brief, a brief uh, overview of some of the key issues discussed at that meeting uh, in relation to here in Northern Ireland? Deputy Speaker, it's always concerning when one of my colleagues asks me to be brief twice. Um, I had the opportunity to both to address formal sessions of the Justice and Home Affairs Council and to have a number of other meetings around that, uh, which included representation, uh, the UK uh, government representation, the Northern Ireland Executive Office, and indeed the Irish representation, uh, to see some of the work which is being done at Europe that we need in Europe, which we need to join up with. Uh, I had uh, one useful meeting. Uh, with staff from the Commission who are looking at the issue of what they call the de-radicalisation agenda, which obviously across most of Europe is uh, directed against those who are on the fringes of Islamic terrorism, but it was also seen to be the potential that looking at experience in Northern Ireland that we could both contribute and benefit from such discussion. I had a specific meeting which was extremely useful with the EU anti-trafficking coordinator discussing Northern Ireland's position with regard to the directive. Um, Whilst it's certainly not my place to uh, indicate what her view was, um, she will have to make an assessment of where Northern Ireland stands. She did not lead me to believe that Northern Ireland was other than in a good place around trafficking matters. And indeed, um, I said she might well wish to come and visit Northern Ireland to see uh, the situation on the ground. And I would be suggesting to the Justice Committee that they may well wish to take evidence from her as part of their review of Lord Morrow's bill. And indeed, Lord Morrow may wish to meet her himself. I think it would be useful. And I say that um, knowing that she didn't agree entirely with everything that I was saying, but I believe that she has a specific role in the EU that we should take note of. Call Mr McCarthy for right. supplementary. Thank the Minister for making a brief statement and brief replies as normally does. But in relation to following, following on from the, the human trafficking issue, were there any uh, learning points that could be factored into our approach to this issue uh, or into the legislation currently being um, considered uh, here at home? Well, the House would expect me to say that, of course, we have got the legislation in a very good place as it is. Um, but I think we do always need to learn, and it will be interesting to see when she produces her reports of what uh, Mrs. Basilidou uh, suggests about Northern Ireland, about other similar jurisdictions, what we may learn from each other. Um, I think it would probably also be appropriate at this point to say that having had a, a useful discussion last week with Lord Morrow about the, the uh, Department's attitude to aspects of his bill, I believe that we are getting a better joined up system within Northern Ireland, which I think will put us at the forefront of work being done in Europe. Call Mr Ian Milne for talking about Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister, Minister uh, do you believe that there are organised groups involved in the recent spat of thefts? Um, of cattle and farm machinery from farm holdings? Well, I don't have any specific in information as to exactly what way um, thefts like cattle thefts are being uh, organised, Deputy Speaker. There clearly is an issue in some parts of Northern Ireland as there is an issue about rural crime generally, but I'm not sure that I have the specific information which would give any particular benefits on that point. What is important is that we see as ever a joined up approach, that we see cooperation between uh, the relevant agencies, that we see the kind of good work being done by PCSPs uh, to deal with some rural crime issues being carried forward. Um, and I certainly hope that what we will see from the Rural Crime Unit, which is a joint operation between NFU Mutual, the police and my department, that we will be able to identify trends and better fight them. Mr. Mellon, for supplementary. Era, the G. Shaw. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his uh, answers uh, thus far. Does the Minister feel that measures that, has been, that he has in place with his counterparts in the 26 counties 
are effective uh, in combating the increasing problem that we have in the rural areas. Well, Deputy Speaker, I'm not particularly aware that the, the rural crime uh, that we face at the moment is particularly a cross-border issue, though I am aware, for example, of um, some items of valuable machinery which have been taken across border and indeed across the water and even in some cases to continental Europe. So it is an issue where the sort of work being done by the Organised Crime Task Force joining up on a cross-border basis will be useful. But it's very difficult to establish trends in what is uh, a, a difficult and complex area. And clearly, there is some rural crime which is not agricultural crime. We need to address that at the same time as we address issues like machinery theft and cattle rustling. Call Mr. John McAllister for public comment. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, on the question of uh, uh, his abortion consultation and the, the guidance around that, um, can I ask the Minister? Is this a case of one minister passing responsibility to another because he doesn't want to face up to the responsibilities of dealing with this issue? I'm sure the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, Deputy Speaker, would not really ask any minister to criticise any other minister in the House on any circumstances. Um, I think the, re the reality is that we are in the, the slightly unusual position that the guidelines relating to abortion were a matter for the Minister of Health, but the criminal law relating to abortion <coughs> is a matter of the Minister for Justice. And those are the, you know, that's the, the reality of the challenge. When, when the matter passed beyond guidelines, then it became clearly a matter for the Justice Department. I don't think, um, much as Mr McAllister might uh, wish to encourage me to criticise uh, my ministerial colleague Edwin Poots, I don't think it's the case that he has ducked it. I think he has, you know, he has carried the, uh, the issue to, you know, as far as he can. And it's clearly an issue that the very difficult challenge of how we manage fatal fetal abnormality cannot be dealt with by health measures alone. Call Mr McAllister for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. And uh, he's absolutely right. I would have been quite content if he had criticised his ministerial colleague. Um, I'm surprised them showing a rare uh, effort of collective responsibility. Um, could I then take from the Minister's question, and, uh, is this correct, that if he is changing the law and if he's successful in changing the law and clarifying the law around fatal fetal abnormality, will it be his department that will publish the guidelines or the Department of Health? Well, Deputy Speaker, the, the guidelines uh, which uh, were a court directive to the Department of Health, whether they be the responsibility of Mr. Poots, Mr. Wells or anybody else at particular times in the future. The, um, the issue of setting the criminal law is an issue not just for me, but for this Assembly as representing the people of Northern Ireland, but the specific departmental responsibility falls to the DOJ. So we, uh, we need to be clear of, of the difficulty of getting that joined-up approach, but I do believe that we have the option to do it. We will have to see that we get the law right, and then hopefully we won't need guidelines to explain it. Call Ms. B. of McLaughlin. Uh, would the Minister agree that the recent book by Anne Cadwalder and the Panorama documentary highlights that the uh, rot rotten apple in the barrel theory is, is merely wishful thinking? For a moment. No, Deputy Speaker, I wouldn't. <laughs> Could we have a supplementary, please? I'm a bit all, extremely disappointed uh, with the Minister's response, but can I ask the Minister directly then how many instances of collusion in different places in different years by different British state organisations does it actually take for him to accept that collusion was both systematic and endemic? As I've said many times before in this House, Deputy Speaker, I am responsible for devolved justice matters for the last three and a half years. My, my opinion is no more worth it well than any other member of this House's opinion in an area on which I have, for which I have no responsibility and, more to the point, no information. Uh, we just could get one very short question from Mr Sean Lynch, and I would appreciate members not shouting from a senatorial position. That does not help. I'll get to the last one, call you. Does the Minister agree that more needs to be done to try and warn those who get involved in illegal activities such as protests and end up with a criminal record? 
Well, I think, Deputy Speaker, I could only echo the comments made by the current Chairman of the Parades Commission in his media interview at the weekend when he pointed out the number of young people who have acquired criminal records because they had been misled over street protests. And, of course, it's, that's not the only way in which young people get misled into criminal activity, but it is a salutary reminder of what can happen when people follow the lead of those who do not have their best interests at heart. We don't have time for a supplementary because time is up. And that concludes question time. I invite members to take their ease while the top table is changed. Order. The Minister of Justice wishes to make a statement. Minister. <clears throat> With permission, Deputy Speaker, I wish to make a statement regarding a meeting under the auspices of the Intergovernmental Agreement on Cooperation on Criminal Justice Matters on Friday, the 15th of November. I hosted and represented the Executive at the meeting, which was attended by Alan Shatter, TD, Minister for Justice, Equality and Defence. This was the seventh formal ministerial meeting under the IGA since the devolution of justice in April 2010. As I've said in previous statements to the House, I'm committed to keeping the Assembly informed of meetings held under the auspices of the agreement on the same basis as NSMC meetings. The meeting on 15th of November provided us both with an opportunity to review final progress against the 2012-13 joint work programme as well as formally agree a joint work programme for 2013-14, which will run through to the summer of 2014. It was pleasing to note the positive progress that has been made in a number of areas. These include the sharing of information between the probation services on short pre-sentence reports and short turnaround reports aimed at speeding up justice, the successful transfer and processing of 60 drugs cases from FSNI to the Irish Forensic Science Laboratory, and progress made by the PSNI towards completion of a good practice guide and toolkit for policing in partnership with diverse communities, which will be shared with Angada Shikona. These are just some of the examples which demonstrate the excellent ongoing cooperation between criminal justice agencies across both jurisdictions. One of the actions within the current work programme was the organisation of the fourth annual Joint Public Protection Seminar. That seminar was held in Hillsborough Castle on the same day as our meeting. The theme of the seminar was partnership working for public protection, and it provided an opportunity for representatives of both probation services alongside other agencies to discuss a number of key public protection issues. These included a coordinated strategic response to dealing with mental health within criminal justice, responding to the needs of prisoners with mental health issues, developing a response for young adult offenders, developing a strategy to deal with accommodation issues, and engaging with victims. The seminar also saw the launch of Volume 10 of the Irish Probation Journal, an extremely professional joint publication from PBNI and the Irish Probation Service. Having addressed the, the previous three annual seminars, I was particularly pleased to join Alan Shatter in opening the fourth annual seminar. I have attached to the printed version of this statement a copy of the Joint Work Programme for 2013-14. I intend to give a detailed report on progress made against the actions following the next IGA meeting before the summer of 2014. In the interim, progress against the actions will be monitored by the working group of officials. Six project advisory groups provide the mechanism by which work is taken forward. They focus on public protection, registered offenders, youth justice, forensic science, support for victims of crime, and social diversity. Each of the project advisory groups has continued to promote and support cooperation across the broad spectrum of criminal justice agencies on both sides of the border. Examples of cross-border cooperation that will be taken forward include the drafting and development of a forensic partnership strategy and action plan covering the forensic science services of Northern Ireland, Ireland and Scotland, the hosting of a cross-border seminar on hate crime, 
ongoing discussion on the European Victims Directive, the development of an information sharing agreement between the two police services relating to domestic and child abuse, and the development of a protocol between the juvenile justice centres. In relation to the management of sex offenders, there is excellent ongoing cooperation between the PSNI and Agada Shikana at an operational level. I am pleased to report that there continues to be good progress in supporting and promoting North-South cooperation to make Northern Ireland and the island of Ireland a safer place. The meeting was a good opportunity to be updated on the establishment of an ad hoc North-South Crime Strategy Group, which has met three times during 2013 and will report future progress to the working group of, offic of officials. The IGA provides a helpful framework for supporting North-South cooperation on criminal justice matters, but the real benefits of cooperation are seen as individuals within the criminal justice agencies develop strong working relationships with their respective counterparts. It is that type of practical, informal and ongoing interaction and cooperation that Alan Shatter and I are both committed to further promoting and supporting. Finally, as I've said before, the agreement is not intended to provide for discussion of cross-border security issues. However, I have cause to discuss such matters regularly with Mr. Shatter, and I use the opportunity of us being together to briefly discuss some general, wider cross-border security-related issues. These included the work being done in the areas of tackling organised crime, fuel laundering and human trafficking. <clears throat> and I call the chairperson of the Justice Committee, Mr Paul Given. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for uh, bringing the statement to the House today. In respect of human trafficking, a very important aspect that needs to be tackled to address the organised crime rule, he will be aware of the uh, all-party Oroctus report that was unanimously supported in terms of switching off the red light campaign and endorsed by all elements of civic society. That, in its report, calls for the criminalisation of the payment of sexual services. Has that been talked about yet? Uh, and in the context of them taking forward legislation, has the Minister also updated his counterpart about the efforts of this Assembly to tackle this heinous crime? Well, I thank Mr Given for that point. Um, I'm not sure that despite the Oireachtas Joint Committee report uh, on prostitution legislation uh, that there is legislation likely in the near future in the Oireachtas. Um, certainly I did have the opportunity to discuss the ongoing business of the Assembly in the context of Lord Morrow's private members bill and there are issues which are clearly similar north-south as we look to the research to deal with specifically the prostitution issue and also tighten up the human trafficking legislation. Well, Mr Raymond McCartney. Uh, Grimmie, I'm going to pre last concluder. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker, August Vegas, Les uh, Can I ask the Minister, first of all, welcome the statement and the fact that this meeting took place. He spoke about the cooperation between the probation boards, North and South, and in particular to mental health issues around prisoners. Can the, the Minister outline what he, what he feels that the long-term impact of that cooperation would be? I think the long-term impact, Deputy Speaker, will simply around, be around the issue of ensuring that we learn lessons wherever they are to be learnt. There are clearly similarities between society north-south, and there are cross-border issues relating to probation, which we have to deal with. Um, I'm not sure that at this stage we have specific lessons to highlight, but the important thing is that we continue to encourage what I referred to, the ongoing informal meetings and cooperation, so that individuals can learn from each other uh, across both sides of the border, as indeed individuals within our probation service will learn from each other whichever part of Northern Ireland they happen to be in. It's important that we get that informal learning to tie into the kind of formal research which appears in publications like the Irish Probation Journal. I remind members that I'm working off a speaking list, and in that context I call Mr Alban McGuinness. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, Principal uh, Deputy Speaker. Um, could I thank the Minister for his replies? Um, in the final paragraph, Minister, you say that um, uh, the agreement the, uh, is not intended to provide for discussion of cross-border security issues, but in the light of the Smithwick report, where there are specific recommendations made in relation to cross-border policing, isn't it time that the agreement is updated to include those types of recommendations made by Judge Smethick. Well, I think, Deputy Speaker, Mr McGuinness raises an interesting question to see how we will progress on in what you might now term the post-Smithick era. Um, uh, I, I 
I think I always say the agreement is not intended to when I make the statements on the IGA, because the practical reality is when ministers north-south meet, we do end up discussing wider issues informally you know, at the end of the agenda. So there are clearly ways in which these matters are.